Uh, hello, good afternoon, good evening, friends, students, and colleagues. Uh, welcome uh, to our webinar on Japan after the October 31st general election facing the age of disruption, co organized by the Center for Japanese Research uh, at UBC, at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs, together with the Center for the Study of Global Japan at the Monk School in Toronto. Um, I'm Eve Tibergen, Professor of Political Science and Director of the Center for Japanese Research at UBC. Um, in August, Japan was apparently in angry mood at then Prime Minister Suga for the COVID crisis. Then the public was disappointed that the LDP chose Prime Minister Kishida over Kono Taro-san. And lo and behold, Canada, Kishida just won the election with a large majority. Does it mean no change? What was surprising and not surprising in this election what impact does this election have for Japan, for Asia, for global governance, for climate change, you know, as we open the COP26? We're truly thrilled and honored today to have a dream lineup for this discussion. Before going any further, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, as well as the Hosanich people, who have called this area home for many thousands of years and continue to do so today. Since we're on a virtual platform, I'd like to invite you to reflect upon the indigenous lands that you are on today as well. I would like to start also by giving special thanks to our wonderful CJR Center of Japanese Research team, uh, beginning with Christina Song, who led most of the organization of this event, as well as CJR assistant Shiori Uchida, and Are Fuma Aoki, and of course, Mio Otsuka at the Monk School. Uh, on the logistical side, the chat function has been disabled. Questions will be asked in the Q&A window. Please note that this webinar and the following Q&A session will be recorded. We'll make it available on the UBC SPPGA CGR website and probably also on the Toronto website. Uh, and um, we'll share it for at least a limited period of time. You're not required to use your camera or microphone to participate in a Q&A session. Written questions can be submitted to everyone via the Q&A function and upvoted by you. Uh, I will monitor the Q&A window and post questions using attendees' first names only. So we have four wonderful speakers. Uh, we'll go in the following order. Philippe Lipsy from the University of Toronto first, then Mari Miura from Sofia University in Tokyo, followed by Professor Harukata Takenaka from GRIPS in Tokyo and uh, Dr. Sheila Smith at CFR Washington. But first, uh, we are pleased to have uh, Ambassador Joseph Caron offer some introductory remarks. Joseph Caron is a distinguished fellow at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada and an honorary professor at the Institute of Asian Research at UBC. He's a former Canadian High Commissioner to India and former Canadian Ambassador to Japan, but also China. He's a recipient of the Order of the Rising Sun, Gold and Silver. So I'm turning the floor to you, Joseph. Merci beaucoup, Yves. Um, I'm uh, very, very pleased to have been invited to uh, to uh, today's gathering and uh, provided an opportunity to make a few opening remarks. And uh, what I thought I'd do is I would um, uh, speak a bit about what have uh, past Japanese elections produced in terms of national leadership, just sort of a bit of a historical perspective. And then I, I'll spend a couple of minutes on, on the Canada-Japan agenda in the Kishida uh, Trudeau era. Um, between uh, Ikeda Hayato, uh, who became PM uh, in July of 1960, and Kishida's LDP victory yesterday, uh, over those 61 years, Japan has had 28 prime ministers, 24 of whom uh, were LDP leaders. The first exception to LDP dominance, uh, PM Murayama Tomiichi, the head of the uh, Shakaito, the, the Socialist Party, uh, was definitely prime minister. Um, but in fact, having abjured the boilerplate JSP policy planks, such as the US-Japan uh, Security Treaty, was essentially a front for the LDP coalition, uh, which um, also included the uh, new party, Sakigake. Uh, 
Uh, the three other um, DPJ governments uh, were led by Hatoyama, Kan, and Noda, not one of whom served for more than 68 weeks. In the 61 years since Ikeda, Hayato became PM in 1960, LDP politicians were prime ministers for all of, uh, for um, LDP politicians were prime ministers throughout except for five years. In other contexts, such uh, political monopolies would be clear signs of absence of anything other than uh, features of the weakest democracies. Uh, but I would not accuse Japan of not being a strong democracy, uh, given that beyond the short durations of so many administrations, the other pillars of democracy are firmly in place. Rule of law, human rights, open media, ability to criticize even vehemently uh, political and social leaders, and so on and so forth. So why, viewed from the historical record, is there such a dominance uh, by the LDP? There's a lot of academic writing on this, including by some of our, some of our uh, academic leaders here. Um, but I'll give you a non-academic perspective uh, from 17 years of living in Japan. I think that the virtual permanence of the LDP is explained by the following factors, among many others. Fundamentally, the structural framework of national elections in Japan have for decades been successfully designed uh, to keep the LDP in power. And I'll give you a few examples. Uh, despite the fact that Article 54 of the Constitution allows, for example, for the uh, House of Representatives, yesterday's election, up to 40 days between dissolution and the election itself, campaigns are much, much shorter, such as the 12 days or so uh, that elapsed between dropping of the writ uh, a, few, a couple of weeks ago and yesterday's election. This provides a very tight time frame for opposition parties to make their case to the public. Quite intentionally, Japanese laws um, uh, drastically limit the scope of campaigning. Um, illegal are various forms of advertising common in North America and in Europe. Door-to-door -door campaigning is illegal. Um, there are limits uh, to campaign budgets and such minutiae as the size of election posters. Those of us who live in Japan, those of you who live in Japan, see these very limited size posters uh, up and down the streets. Nothing succeeds like success, however. 58 years of post-war, uh, post-1960 uh, uh, governance has given the LDP a stranglehold on national budgets and uh, their vast pork barrel potential at the local level. Vote for me and you'll get a new road or sewage line or what uh, have you, a promise that the LDP candidate can deliver given their decades of extremely close collaboration uh, with the government bureaucrats, many of whom become LDP members themselves. Thus, the, bureaucrat, the bureaucrats can refuse or make difficult life for the LDP, um, can either be helpful or make life difficult uh, for um, uh, their political leaders, and certainly uh, those of us who lived through partly the Hatoyama Khan Noda era know about the war between the bureaucrats and, uh, uh, and the then government. No other party uh, in post-war Japan has been able to guarantee the kind of outcome uh, that uh, the um, LDP does. Article 15 of the Constitution states that universal adult suffrage is guaranteed with regard to election of public officials. This has been structurally honored in the breach. Uh, the value of the votes uh, in both the upper and lower house should be equal uh, to the total name of voters, uh, an issue that the Japanese Supreme Court ruled on at various times. But the gap between rural voters overrepresented mathematically and urban voters underrepresented has remained in place uh, in many heavily rural prefectures to the benefit of the LDP. The LDP has also brilliantly developed the principle that if you lose, you win, thanks to being able to run a candidate uh, in both a single seat and proportional representation seats, as happened yesterday to former LDP Sekjan Amidi Akira, um, uh, former digit, uh, digitalization minister uh, Hirai Takia, former Olympics minister Sakurada Yoshitaka, and uh, Wakamiya Kenji, who was minister in charge of the Olympics. They all lost their single seats, but they're still parliamentarians because they won on the list. Now, all this doesn't mean that the LDP can never lose elections. Uh, if the upper house elections next summer fail to maintain uh, LDP control as happened in 2007, we could have a repeat of the aftermath 
which was the subsequent loss of the lower, uh, of the lower house uh, two years later. Fear of that kind of precedent will influence uh, policy making uh, and the forthcoming parliament. We will have to wait and see. All that said, you get what you pay for. And it has to be said that the LDP has delivered some leaders who were remarkably effective prime ministers. They and their cabinets shaped much of Japan's post-war polity, uh, economy and society, uh, led the creation of the world's third largest economy, all of that in relative peace with the world. Uh, they thus received broad public support for what they did, warts and all. My personal list of effective prime ministers, which includes some unsavory characters, uh, by the way, um, uh, would include Ikeda, Sato, Miki, Nakasone, Takeshita, and some of you will gasp at that, I'm sure, um, Miyazawa, uh, Koizumi, Hatoyama, more gasping, uh, and Abe, Abe Shinzo. These include uh, the strong ones who won consecutive elections and weaker ones who nevertheless left, uh, left their mark. That's why I include Hatoyama, uh, who uh, despite everything succeeded in advancing uh, Japan's social safety nets while he was very briefly prime minister. Whether Kishida will be one of the truly effective prime ministers or just another revolving door uh, prime minister, what uh, the Japanese call uh, Kaiten Shusho, just like the Kaiten Sushi that we have in our restaurants here in Vancouver. Uh, I expect that uh, uh, Dr. Lipsy Smith, Amura, and Takenaka will, will have views on, on that particular question. So let me just conclude with uh, some thoughts on, on Canada Japan. Reflecting on the Liberal Party platform of the recently re elected uh, Trudeau government and the campaign promises made by PM Kishida and the LDP. I can conceive of collaboration between our two governments in some of the following areas. The geopolitical conditions faced by Canada and Japan are very different in our respective and immediate geographic environments, but they are more clearly joined when considering the broader, uh, broader Indo-Pacific. Japan is a member of the Quad, Canada is not. The Liberal platform did not even mention the Quad uh, or, in the, or the Indo-Pacific um, specifically, but it did promise a new Asia-Pacific strategy, quote, to deepen diplomatic, economic, and defense partnerships in the region, including by navigating new bilateral trade agreements and so on and so forth. So maybe there will be something to this. Prime Ministers uh, Abe and Trudeau in uh, 2019 called for increased bilateral collaboration on peace and security issues, peacekeeping, joint training, personnel training, uh, disaster relief, and so on and so forth. So there is great potential not to speak of urgency uh, in both countries working together in these areas. Given Chinese detention of Canadians Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, Canada has begun to exercise leadership on an international effort to, quote, eradicate, unquote, arbitrary detention. We will look to Japan for close cooperation on this issue, particularly in light of Japan's own experiences uh, with the DPRK kidnappings of its own citizens. Kishida has promised action to reduce the vulnerability of critical supply chains and te of technologies and material resources. Canada, of course, is resource rich and also has a strong high tech sector, a natural partner in meeting some of the Japanese government's strategic objectives. Um, these and other initiatives, however, and this I think is an important point, these will only lead to effective cooperation if Prime Minister Kishida uh, himself a uh, remarkably versatile and informed internationalist among LDP members for being uh, Japan's uh, longest serving post-war foreign minister, can find common ground uh, with Prime Minister Trudeau. And on that front, I worry a bit because uh, our Prime Minister um, uh, has uh, proceeded in his Asia policy, not without making a few, a few errors. And we're now on our fifth uh, foreign minister. So uh, Canada will have to get its act together, I think, to be able to uh, very usefully for both Japan and Canada to uh, um, uh, participate and work with the new Kishida administration. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Joseph. That was great. So I'm turning the floor now to uh, Professor Philippe Lipsy from Toronto. Mm. Oh. 
Well, thank you to Eve and the Center for Japanese Research uh, for jointly hosting this event. I look forward to this becoming the first of many uh, collaborations moving forward. Um, can, you, can you see my slides okay? Yes. Okay, all right, wonderful. Um, so um, I would um, like to begin um, the set of panels by essentially uh, doing a bit of intro uh, about the election that just happened. Um, and so I'll, I'll begin with you know some basic punchlines. Um, you know what what happened uh, in in the election uh, that just concluded. Um, so basically, you know, overall, this looks like uh, an election that uh, worked out well for the LDP. Um, they uh, won a significant share of seats um, and uh, lost a few, but uh, maintained their majority. Um, it looks like a significant disappointment, on the other hand, for the CDPJ uh, with a loss of 13 seats when many forecasts had them gaining. Um, and Ishin, uh, you know, according to many reports, uh, is seen as a bit of uh, a winner uh, in that they gain seats. But if you look at the data, as, I, as I'll show you uh, shortly, um, they're basically coming back to where they were a couple of elections ago. So it doesn't look like a major shift uh, in Ishin's standing. Um, and so I think of this uh, election in some ways as the election of two gambles, one by the LDP and one by the CDPJ. Maybe there are more gambles we could talk about, but maybe these are the, the biggest ones. And so the LDP's gamble, in my view, was uh, the selection of uh, Kishida over Kono as prime minister. Um, and so if you look at, you know, this is just one example um, polls about who deserves to be prime minister. Uh, Kona had a very clear popularity advantage over um, just about everybody else, not just other LDP politicians. Uh, this is from Kyoto, but you could have looked at other polls that show uh, something similar. Um, and Kishida, you know, was very much sort of in the middling zone, not disliked, but not super popular either. And um, you know the, the trade-off that the LDP faced in many ways was between choosing Kono, who's very popular with the public, um, but who has in the past supported various reformist policies that play well with the general public, but um, are opposed by many LDP conservatives and may have ended up dividing the party, right? So things like uh, his op opposition to nuclear power, which is quite long-standing, uh, support for fairly aggressive climate change policies, and a variety of social issues um, that uh, put him uh, kind of uh, in opposition to many conservatives within his own party, though he tried to soften his position, obviously, during the leadership contest. On the other hand, Kishida is less popular, but I think there was a sense that he's less likely to really push hard on reforms that would end up dividing the LDP. That, so Kishida was in some sense a safer choice on that front. Um, so the LDP gamble in some sense was the electoral will still support the LDP even with this somewhat less popular leader that they didn't necessarily have to go to Kono. Um, maybe they could still pull off a win even with the somewhat less popular face. Um, on the other hand, uh, for the CDPJ, um, I think the big gamble was uh, pursuing electoral cooperation uh, really in earnest with the Communist Party, the JCP. Of course, the upside here is the way the Japanese electoral system is structured in single member districts, consolidating the opposition is a major advantage and uh, in some sense necessary uh, for the opposition to do well. Uh, but there's a downside, and uh, you know this was seen during the election campaign, ideological incoherence. And even within the ranks of CDPJ supporters, some CDPJ members, there's uh, deep skepticism towards the Communist Party. So I think the gamble here was basically, it'll work out. Cooperating with the communists is worth it, despite the costs. 
Um, and so, you know, who won these gambles? Um, you know, the easy answer, of course, is the LDP because the election went in their favor. Um, and it looks like they calculated correctly in some sense that uh, even with Kishida, who might be less charismatic in some sense, um, the ruling coalition secured a very significant victory. Um, and Kono is still available as a future prime minister if they face stronger headwinds and need somebody with that charisma to pull them through in a very difficult election. I think the CDPJ calculation is less clear in the sense that the election outcome suggests that they didn't do very well. Um, but on the other hand, if you unpack individual races, there are many tight races. And you could argue that the CDPJ has, at this point, emerged as a more credible opposition threat to the LDP, which could have consequences. So this is a figure uh, that I like to present to my students that basically adds up all the votes that could possibly be cast in Japanese elections. So it adds up uh, both the SMD and PR tiers. So every person gets two votes and the grays are abstentions, right? And when you calculate it this way, it, it takes out a little bit of the coordination that goes on between Koma and LDP, for example, where they switch votes. Uh, between the tiers. And what you see, of course, is that going all the way back to 2003, the LDP has really only had a big bump in votes in the 2005 election, the postal election with Koizumi. And otherwise, they've been really stable, right? They've been managing to turn out uh, about the same number of votes election after election. Um, and the real action in Japan has really been over here uh, on the opposition party. The red here is the DPJ and then the CDPJ, uh, you had the big surge in uh, the DPJ's popularity into 2003, 2005, 2009, and the LDP pulled out a massive victory in 2005, thanks to Koizumi, and then 2009, the DPJ comes to power. And really, the subsequent LDP victories haven't been because the LDP is popular, but because the opposition has collapsed, split, uh, you know, recombined in different ways, and this big gray zone here, which is the abstentions, have increased dramatically, right? And so uh, the LDP relies to some degree on large abstentions and the opposition being reasonably split uh, and ineffectual to stay in power. And so this is how this translates into seat shares, right? So the LDP, including this recent election, has held sizable majorities despite that very stable seat share. And it's really only in 2009 that they lost dramatically. And you see Ishin here again, you know, they, they're kind of the story of the evening, but their seat share this time is not really different from 2014. And so I don't know that Ishin is necessarily sort of on a good trajectory, right? They seem to almost have disappeared. And so they're, they're back to some degree. But, um, you know, I think the big story still remains between the DPJ, CDPJ and the LDP Kome coalition, in my view, anyway. Um, and so unpacking the sort of electoral coordination, you know, th this is just an example, right? Uh, District um, 10 in Tokyo, where in 2017, this is the previous election, it looked like the CDPJ could have won if it coordinated better with other opposition parties, right? The LDP candidate won about 38% of the vote, 37% of the vote. Um, CDPJ was about 10 points behind, but if you combine uh, Party of Hope and Communist Party, then they could have uh, amassed more votes than the LDP. So this is the basic rationale for, yes, the opposition does need to coordinate. And this time around, they still lost, but through the coordination, they were only about two points behind. So they came very close. And he, there are many districts that look like this. The CDPJ couldn't quite uh, win uh, a major victory, but they came close enough that if there is a small swing in vote shares in the next election, they could end up swinging the seat shares quite a bit. And, and that's important, of course, right? Because under the Japan's current electoral system, um, the CDPJ now puts itself in a position of being um, a credible threat to the LDP. And I, I would argue that that's not a trivial thing. I think that is gonna affect the way the LDP governs because uh, it, it puts them a little bit on the edge. Um, and so uh, Takeo Hoshi and I uh, published a co-edited volume recently about the Abe government. And we argued that um, the Abe government 
governed based on what we call the Abe model, which combined reformist appeal under the banner of Abenomics, the use of snap elections to maintain party discipline, kind of keeping backbenchers on edge and the centralization of authority. And so what, what's, what's happened, right? Suga didn't seem to really, uh, uh, he wasn't able to continue this despite uh, being kind of one of the masterminds of the model. I would say she does seems to be retreating on the reformist rhetoric. Um, so number one looks a little bit questionable. And this number two, which is, can the prime minister really threaten calling a snap election and therefore maintain party solidarity and control over his own party? It's not so clear to me that that's gonna work as effectively now that the opposition is a real threat uh, with this coordination. And so there seem to be more ingredients for a weak prime minister now than under the Abe government. Um, how about the CDPJ? So uh, another book I co-edited was about Japan under the DPJ government. Um, and I think the CDPJ um, has kind of inherited weaknesses from the predecessor DPJ. And, and the big one is weakness in local politics. Um, there isn't really a pipeline of up and coming CDPJ politicians from the local level that in the same way that the LDP has and during the COVID crisis, I think this really hurt the CDPJ because they couldn't demonstrate governing competence, right? If you imagine a world where the governors of Tokyo and Osaka were CDPJ politicians, they could have credibly made the case that we are able to deal with COVID more effectively than the LDP, but they were completely unable to do this. And Ishin kind of was able to capitalize on that to a much greater extent. But also things like Ozawa's upstream strategy that worked quite effectively um, in the 2007 election and broadening the appeal of the DPJ to rural areas hasn't really been replaced with something to capitalize on the Abe government's aggressive agriculture reform strategies, for example, that could plausibly be an opening. Um, and if you look at who's voting for the CDPJ, there, there doesn't seem to be sort of an expansion, right? Uh, the, the youth vote is drifting towards the LDP. Women are not really supporting the CDPJ, even though the policies, if you look, if you read the policies, the CDPJ seems to have, um, you know, much more pro-women stance than the LDP on many issues. And so I would say, despite the LDP maybe not being in a great position uh, as, as much as the vote share would imply, the CDPJ also has a lot of work to do. And so we may, we may I, I suppose it's a little bit of a pessimistic prognosis in some sense, neither the LDP nor the CDPJ in my view end up looking too good coming out of this election. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. Uh, so now I'm turning to Professor Mari Miura from Sofia University. Hello, good morning, Eve. Thank you very much for organizing as in such a great event. I'd like to share my screen, although I sort of cheated. I cut, can you see it? Oh, yes. I yeah. just cut and pasted it from various Japanese newspapers. So it's not really I mean, uh, uh, interactive like uh, the Philips uh, uh, slides. So in addition to what uh, the Philip had just said, uh, with rich information about uh, the result of the, the past election, I'd like to uh, add a little bit of like a women's uh, perspective and what happened to women candidates because the gender equality has been on, on, on agenda uh, in the last two, three years and more and more people are actually demanding for a greater gender equality uh, in the Japanese society. This is very become remarkable culture shift that I'm observing in Japan. So people expected that the women will be more elected. Unfortunately, that was not. So the result was truly shocking to me, uh, the someone who has been working hard to increase women uh, politicians. And the ratio, the women make up only 9.7% uh, 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 out of this election, which means that there was a decline uh, from 10.1% in uh, 2017. Uh, in, in, with actual number, only uh, 45 women were elected as opposed to uh, 47 women uh, who were elected last time. 
so it was truly shocking to many uh, Japanese who expected that uh, Japan will gradually and steadily moving forward toward gender equality, which was not the case. So why that was the case? Uh, as uh, Philip has clearly showed, because ADP and Kome want the seas, and these two parties are not really uh, active in promoting uh, women candidates. That's the number of uh, women uh, elected officials by a party. I'm sorry, that's in Japanese. So this is LDP. Uh, women make up uh, only 7.7%. And this is uh, C uh, CDP, and that's 13.5%. Uh, and the Kome, 12.5%. Uh, and JCP, that's the highest. Uh, next to Reva at 20%, and Ishin is around 10%, and, and uh, Kokumin, that's a, a Democrat party for the people, that's about 10%, and the, uh, the Social Democrat zero, and the Reva is about 30%. So this means that if ADP wins elections, there is less chance for women to be elected. And if you look at the numbers, actually LDP and Kome the number of women elected under this, the ticket of these two parties was exactly the same. So it's, they, they show the great status quo. And CDP and the JCP tried to increase women candidates, but they didn't get enough votes. And instead, Ishin gained some seats. And Ishin, again, is not that enthusiastic about uh, promoting a women's issue. So because of this, uh, we didn't see the uh, increase of women candidates. But good news is that, and more and more women, more and more women are likely to win under a single seat districts, uh, thanks to the unified candidate strategy. Women candidates benefited enormously from this uh, coordination strategy. Um, so, if you look at the so, if you look at the uh, numbers, uh, oh women candidate who won under SSDs or PR, usually women are more likely to be win under PR, but situation is actually reversed this time. Uh, CD uh, opposition women won more under SSDs than PR. So that means that women candidates benefited from this unified candidate strategy, but uh, opposition parties didn't get much seats under PR. So that's why we see the reversal uh, situation among uh, women candidates this time. So what's next? What, what can we do? <laughs> so these are the sl slides of uh, el uh, the, the generational and also uh, gender-wise uh, breakdown of elected officials. So not, more than 90% of MPs in the lower house is men, and most are 50s, 60s, 70s. There is one 80s, that's Nikai, and there is one uh, man who is 20s. But women, uh, you know, uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, but anyway, there's a, a huge gap uh, by uh, gender. And gender parity law was actually enacted uh, three years ago, and I have been involved in the, this uh, lawmaking process of gender parity law because that was a pri private member's bill and I was uh, advisor uh, of the uh, cross-partisan, all-partisan parliamentary group uh, that drafted the bill. And it aims to gender parity in candidacy. That means that it requires all the parties to aim at the, the beauty of the law is aim at, aim at a field in the equal number of male and female candidates. And all the parties agreed. So it was passed unanimously at the Diet three years ago. But nonetheless, the parties do not really respect the principle of the law. And um, the law was actually enacted this year. It is usually amazing that the law was uh, revised within three years. And the new clause was added by this amendment. A new clause was about to prevent a harassment against women candidates because it, it's been heavily reported that many women candidates and politicians were harassed, uh, sexually harassed and harassed uh, because they're pregnant. 
not only by uh, the you know powerful male uh, politicians, but also from uh, voters. So vote harassment, sort of some harassment is a, a, a it's a harassment uh, by voters and voters saying that uh, if they can get a, some sexual favor and they will vote for her. So that kind of uh, uh, harassment is quite uh, known. So a new law was added, but only one party uh, which set up a sort of a committee to prevent a sexual harassment against women in politics. And uh, all parliamentary group wanted to make a uh, numerical target mandatory. Uh, but LDP and Akome and all Ishin opposed such a mandatory uh, numerical target. So uh, th that, that revision was not included this time. But I think uh, from, this ex uh, from the result of the new election, it is clear that with that numerical target, the parties, especially uh, LDP and Ishin will not uh, increase women. They do not have a political will to increase a women candidates. So we need us. We need to address a such structural problem. Otherwise, it, it would be almost impossible that Japan pass uh, the ten percent or fifteen percent bar. Um, so how can we create such political will? I think it all boils down to the pressure coming from the civil society. And uh, as I said in the beginning, a civil society has been quickly changing and the more people talk about uh, gender issues, uh, human rights issues, uh, climate changes. So I think uh, the society eventually uh, put enough pressure to ADP to change. And what is remarkable this time is that many articles in the newspaper talk about gender issues, especially the separate family names. Japan is the only country in the world which uh, requires married couple to use only one family name. Japan is the only one country in the world. So lots of advocate groups uh, did a campaign and the media also reported such uh, the opinion poll changes. And uh, uh, Mainichi Shimbun counted the number of the article which talk about gender. The last election, there was three during that 12 days campaign period. There are only three articles uh, in Mainichi Shimbun which talk about gender and one article about separate family name four years ago. But this year, there are 59 articles which talk about gender and 66 articles which touch upon the issue of separate family names. It's a huge change. And also, if you look at the all major newspapers, four years ago, there is only nine articles which talk about gender, but this time 229. <laughs> it, it's a big shift. And uh, with respect to separate family name, that was 94 four years ago, and this year 282. So it's, you, you can see that it's a clear a sh cultural shift uh, in the media. And, and Sorry, and oops, I take it down. And um, lots of NGOs conducted surveys uh, during this campaign uh, to parties and individual candidates to reveal their positions regarding the issues that they care about. Of course, separate family names and quotas, but immigration policy or abortion or LGBTQ issues, or climate change, housing policy and the welfare, etc. I was so surprised to see the diversification of issues. But however, those issues, those, those news, those uh, results were basically shared through SNS. So if you're not aware of this campaign, you never know. So the media, the mainstream media didn't really pay attention to this type of civil society movement. But I would say that this kind of shift uh, and also social movement will continue to rise instead of decline. So I think we need to pay attention to uh, such changes. And in United States, or in, in many other countries, people talk about Generation Z or Gen Z, and this new generation are more aware of social issues and climate change. And often the time people said that Japanese uh, young generation are very conservative and they support ADP. So Japan is very anomaly with respect to uh, the new phenomena of Generation Z. 
But uh, according to NNN uh, exit poll, 8.3% uh, of teenagers uh, care about gender issues when it comes to voting decisions, 8.3. You may think that that's very tiny, but among the 70s, there was 0.6%. <laughs> so you can see that there's a huge gap. Of course, the, the, the major issue that teenagers cared about was COVID-19, which we'll be soon talk about the uh, and, and that was economic recovery uh, uh, among the 20s. Of course, the major issue is always in the COVID-19 crisis or economic recovery, et cetera. But nonetheless, we should pay attention to this uh, growing tiny minority who care about human rights issues and gender equality. And so I would say that this kind of Generation Z exists although they are still a tiny minority, but it's gonna be growing, uh, I suppose. And if you, uh, uh, and also a national review of the Supreme Court justice was also done uh, simultaneously with the general elections. And there was a campaign, a national campaign to vote no to four judges who are against separate family names. And yesterday, the result of Tokyo, Tokyo Metropolitan Area was reviewed, and these four judges received around 11% of no vote compared to 8 to 9% of other judges. So that means that they gain extra two, around 2% 2 point of rejections, non-confidence. So that really, we need to see more on the national trend later, but it shows that, um, you know, th those uh, campaigns succeeded uh, to raise awareness among Japanese voters. Uh, and, and this kind of demand will continue to give pressure to ADP who resist, continue to resist uh, that's uh, allowing separate family names and same sex marriage and all other gender issues. And if I can, I can show the last slide. I don't know if I can do that. Hold on. Yeah. Yes. And this is the, again, exit vote or, or by uh, generation. Then left side is ADP. This is ADP and this is uh, CDP. And these are the uh, teenagers and this is 20s. Uh, teenagers and 20s. So that means that, uh, yes, it, it, there is a tendency that uh, young generation support ADP up to the last elections, but this time there's a decline of support and, and there is an upward trend uh, of support toward uh, CDP. So of course, the gen in terms of the population, uh, young generations make up a uh, very, you know, the, the small portion uh, and also they don't vote, but still I think they do have a uh, cultural power to influence the overall consciousness about what, what, what we need to care. So my conclusion is that I think this is a beginning of the new, new sort of the uh, cultural change of the Japanese society. Thank you. Thank you, Marisan, for bringing the attention on those extraordinary important issues, which are also issues that, that are very salient here in Canada. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, so next, I'm turning to uh, Professor Harukata Takeyaka-san. How are you? Mm. You're still muted. Oops. I'm sorry. So let me re let me restart. Um, thank you very much for having me uh, today, and I'd like to thank uh, Philip and Eve for organizing uh, this uh, webinar on Japanese politics and Kishida cabinet. And I'd like to. Um, so here is some chronology. I mean, this is not necessary because Philip has already gone over. So uh, the Japanese uh, vote. I would like to give uh, my. Uh, I would like to speak about uh, key 
key uh, to domestic policies. What one is uh, that uh, Prime Minister Kishida will tackle after the elections. One is uh, on COVID-19 crisis. I mean, his uh, responses to COVID-19 crisis, and the other is uh, economic policies. So Haru the vote was- Haruka, you may start your slideshow, then it will look bigger. Now it looks pretty small. Mm -hmm. So the voters, Japanese voters, has provided uh, Prime Minister Kishida with enough seats to formulate and implement various policy. Uh, but he does not have time to relax as he has to make some accomplishments uh, by next summer uh, House of Councillors elections. Election. So I go over two key policy areas where he is expected to formulate some uh, some decent come up with some decent policies. Uh, responses to COVID-19 crisis and economic policies. So let me first go over uh, policies to deal with COVID-19 crisis. Uh, here is a number of those who are found positive, um, who are found uh, positive. Uh, this is uh, seven days moving average. So far we have had five waves and we the experts are expecting that we are going to have the sixth one soon. And the government, uh, Prime Minister Kishida has uh, presented the Japanese uh, people uh, two key principles. Uh, he's highlighting uh, the, his, uh, the differences uh, between uh, his uh, responses uh, and the responses uh, by uh, Prime Minister uh, Suga. As uh, Suga has been heavily criticized uh, for not explaining uh, well about his policies and not uh, dealing with the COVID crisis swiftly. So the administration will sincerely explain relevant policies to the Japanese people. The administration refrain from formulating policies based on optimism and we always assume the worst scenario and make shift uh, swift crisis management as necessary. And uh, Kishida, Prime Minister uh, Kishida has made clear that he will take uh, the following measures under the, which are available, which are possible under the current uh, legal framework. Uh, he will expand tests uh, such as PCR tests and an antigen tests. He will continue to promote people to be uh, vaccinated. Uh, he will adopt the vaccine passport. Uh, the government uh, will begin the third shot from uh, next month. And, uh, and in the past three waves, uh, Japan was faced with serious shortage of number of beds which could accommodate patients uh, with, uh, infected with COVID-19. Uh, Kishida promised to increase the number of beds for those infected. And the governors uh, will prepare a new plan to prepare beds. Uh, the government will take uh, make sure that 80 pound sets of those beds prepared will be really available because in the past uh, the prefectures came up with the numbers but uh, some of them were not really available so uh, this time uh, prime minister kishida made a promise that we would make sure that those uh, numbers are uh, reported by uh, the prefectures, governors, would be real. And the government uh, has already ordered public or medical institutions to increase the number of beds by 20%. And the, in, the, the government has been heavily criticized for not preparing enough number of beds, but it has been uh, making um, continuous efforts. So the number it started out around uh, from uh, 15,000. Now it has reached around 40,000. And uh, also uh, the medicines and uh, Prime Minister uh, Kishida has promised to enhance uh, the use of antibody cocktail treatment and uh, to make oral or anti antiviral medicine uh, bearable by the end of this year. And he made commitment to revise the current legal framework and administrative organizations to deal with pandemic. Uh, the, he will amend existing laws to provide more power to central and local governments to impose restrictions on people's movement 
and force medical institutions to provide necessary services. Because uh, currently the government does not have a uh, real or legal power uh, to uh, uh, order, provide orders to the people and to medical institutions. And uh, he will push through more centralization within the government to deal with pandemic. But in the in in in, in past uh, one and a half years dealing with uh, COVID nineteen crisis in Japan, uh, it has become clear that the one problem is that the government does not have enough power over a local uh, prefer a local governments to deal with a uh, pandemic. But the Prime Minister Kishida is a bit ambivalent on uh, how to deal with this issue, these issues. Um, so we are not really sure uh, whether if he's going to revise uh, the relationship between the central and local governments uh, and the power distributions between the two branches of the governments in dealing with uh, pandemic. And now let me turn to economic policies. Uh, he has emphasized that uh, he will create, uh, he, 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 he came up with so-called new Japanese capitalism as uh, he, uh, key, he, his, as the, the, as his uh, economic policy. And uh, he has emphasized that he will create a virtuous cycle between growth and uh, redistribution. And um, so let me explain what, what he means by these two uh, policies. So growth policies, uh, growth strategy, he has made commitment to promote uh, development of new technologies uh, through introduction of funds worth 10 trillion uh, yen to support uh, research in sciences in major uh, Japanese universities. And he also introduced uh, tax incentives uh, for companies to, uh, to, to, to promote companies to, more, to make my investment in research and development. And um, he will increase the companies in the field of semiconductor, uh, quantum computer, uh, biotechnology and clean technology. And he, uh, he has also promised to formulate a clean energy strategy, including resumption of nuclear power plants. And he has launched a new policy in the field of economic statecraft. Um, Prime Minister Kishida promised to formulate national strategy on economic statecraft and to promote, uh, to, to introduce new legislation on economic, uh, on economic security. And uh, he will, uh, he has made commitment uh, to attach more importance to domestic development of the important technologies and domestic production of important parts such as uh, semiconductors, uh, which is uh, symbolized by the recent uh, announcement by TSMC uh, to set up a new factory in Kumamoto prefecture uh, to uh, produce uh, semiconductors. And uh, Kishida has promised to put more restriction uh, on outflows of strategic technology and parts from Japanese companies and the Japanese universities. And uh, he also promised to uh, design digital garden city uh, in, in, in this plan under this uh, strategy, he, he will promote development of 5G infrastructure throughout Japan and also uh, promote development and increase uh, number of workers uh, in rural areas using uh, IC, uh, I mean, inter, uh, information, co uh, information communication technologies. And uh, as regards to redistribution, um, he will promote, uh, he, he, what he says is, what he really says is that he will promote stakeholder capitalism, which makes sure that profits of large companies uh, is, going to, is shared by workers as well as uh, SME suppliers. And he made commitment to protect uh, middle class. And as concrete policies, uh, he promised to increase financial assistance for housing and ed education for households with kids. And he will also raise, raise wages for such professions as nurses, 
uh, child care workers uh, and uh, kindergarten teachers as the government can set other level of wages for such occupations. And uh, the issue, so the, the remaining issue uh, many people here are wondering is what about the reform, okay? Because he has been ambivalent uh, whether he's going to tackle with structural reform. He has been uh, not silent, but he, he has uh, kept low profile on this uh, policy issue. And there are many areas where Japan can make more reforms, such as in the area of telemedicine, uh, as because uh, restrictions remain on the first visit. And uh, the, the, the second uh, issue is uh, distance educations and also uh, ride sharing. Well, Japan is not the exception because I noticed I could not use Uber in Vancouver, but uh, ja <laughs> uh, but uh, Japan is really uh, unique in that we cannot use uh, those riding share services uh, because of strong uh, opposition from taxi business uh, community. And also uh, there are uh, strong uh, restrictions remain on uh, Airbnb uh, vacation rentals. And uh, the rise of Ishin, which uh, was mentioned by uh, Philip uh, means uh, that a significant portion of Japanese voters want the administration to tackle with structural reforms because uh, Ishi was the only uh, political party in this election who made commitment to structural reforms. So if Kishida avoids this agenda, uh, I'm afraid that he will diminish his popularity uh, toward House of Councillors election. So the real issue is whether he, he, he is going to make, whether he's going to make clear uh, uh, if he, he uh, tackles with some reforms in uh, Japanese uh, economic uh, structure and uh, society. Thank you very much. And uh, that was the end of my presentation. Great. Yeah, thank you, Harukata, for a good coverage of policy questions. And now I'm turning to Sheila Smith for foreign policy dimensions. Oh, you're muted. I'm, I'm, yes, there I am. Now I'm unmuted. Um, thank you, Eve, and thank you, Philip, for inviting me to join. It's lovely to be the part of the North America contingent on the panel. Um, I was, I was asked to talk about foreign policy, but if you'll indulge me just a little bit, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the defense and military side of this election, because I, partly because I wrote about it in 2019, but also because it was interesting from that perspective. And then I'll talk a little bit about what I think is ahead for the Kishida cabinet on the foreign policy front more broadly. Um, so uh, let me start with the LDP leadership election, which we all watched uh, with some interest. Um, I think we were all shocked that Mr. Suga decided not to continue, not to contend, that he folded his cards so quickly. Um, but what became very obvious early on, and this is from Mr. Kishida, uh, started it. It was a focus on Japan's defenses and on the China relationship in particular. So there's a very nice interview that Kishida does early on in that Seoul Sai Sen in the president's uh, race for the LDP, um, where he lays out his views on China. Now they're expressed uh, very carefully and very uh, they're very uh, supportive of the government position on Japan's relationship with China. But he calls out China for its increasingly uh, competitive uh, position globally and its assertion of authoritarian practices that are, are not uh, aligned with Japan's own interests of de democratic practice, but also the rule of law uh, and especially the free and open Indo-Pacific concept. So he very quickly positioned himself with the China on the China question, but he also, much to my surprise, uh, positioned himself on the question of Japanese uh, military capability. And he put out there in an early statement that he was willing to consider and thought Japan should consider seriously uh, Japan, uh, the acquisition of what we in Washington would call an offensive strike capability, but it would be a weapon system that would allow Japan to retaliate in case it was attacked. Now, that's not the Kishida that I think most of us 
Uh, no, he was, as, as Ambassador Caron mentioned, he was Japan's longest serving foreign minister. He has emphasized diplomacy and indeed has emphasized Japan's position in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. He hails from Hiroshima, of course. So it's very easy to dub Mr. Kishida as a dove in a, a party with hawks and doves. And I, I'm just gonna caution our listeners, I don't buy into that definition now because I think Japan is in a much different place. And I think we could see that in the LDP race. I'm happy to talk more about that. I wrote a piece this week um, for foreign affairs called Japan's Difficult Choices. And I go into some of that in the, in the piece, but, but I thought it was interesting in the Sosai Sen, already in the LDP leadership race, you had the defense and the military, the investment in military capability issue come to the fore so quickly. And of course, it was accelerated and expanded by Takaichi Sanai's candidacy, and she was very outspoken. Uh, she went further than obviously Mr. Kishida saying that Japan should be spending up to 2% of uh, its GDP on defense. Uh, Japan should accept uh, the deployment of intermediate uh, nuclear forces, uh, intermediate range forces, they don't have to be nuclear, um, on Japanese soil. Uh, and also she spoke about electromagnetic weapon systems and got very technical on that side of offensive capability. But, but what, it was interesting throughout the debates for the, the leadership race in the, of the LDP that everybody was asked in these debates, where, well, where would you stand on this issue? If America came to you and said, would you deploy uh, intermediate range uh, missiles on Japanese territory, would you say yes? And poor Mr. Kono was sort of backing away from a position there because he didn't want to put himself on the line. Uh, on that issue, he basically said, America hasn't asked us to do that. And until then, I don't have a position. But so you saw in this LDP leadership race, um, military policy, defense policy come to the fore in a way that you haven't seen, I think, in previous races. Now, it's been a part, obviously, of the LDP conversation. But we've always watched the LDP balancing act between its more cosmopolitan uh, people like Kishida, and it's people who are a little bit more invested in, in, in Japanese hard power resources and defenses. Um, and I think that's an interesting piece of this election or that was leading into this, this uh, lower house election. Now, I do think um, the LDP buried the lead, so to speak, <laughs> in its campaign platform. In other words, this may have been part of the internal LDP debate, but it certainly did not go out on the stump with, uh, with folks campaigning in this lower house election. It was, however, part of the LDP party platform. And Kishida-san very early on decided that Takaichi Sanai needed to have a voice in the development of the LDP platform. He put her in charge of the policy research council in the party, and therefore she, and somebody who worked with her was tasked with writing that, that manifesto for this election. 2% of GDP, the aspiration of investing 2% of Japan's GDP in defense was part of the official campaign uh, platform of the LDP. And that's the that's a first. Now, um, what happens in the election, of course, is during the campaign, uh, candidates were vague about their, their position on defense. Do we need to invest more in defense? NHK has a candidate survey that comes out the week before the election. It's very effective uh, across a range of issues. So I, of course, zeroed in on the, the defense issue and this question of defense spending. And about there were about 835 candidates who responded to the NHK survey. And, and about 60% of those who responded said, yes, Japan needs stronger defenses. So 93% of the LDP candidates were willing to say that, but so too were the bulk of the Kometo candidates, as well as, as you guessed it, Ishin no Kai candidates. So the Ishin has a, a strong defense position. So campaign, so the political elites in this campaign were willing to go to the polls. They were willing to identify themselves as saying Japan needs stronger defenses. They didn't say 2%. The question was not specific on missiles or any kind of weapon systems. It was simply a question of does Japan need to up its defense budget? And so you had a, a pretty consistent 60% voice in that saying yes from among the candidates. Um, but that doesn't say that the Japanese public 
uh, feels the same way. And unfortunately, this is the part where elections get a little bit difficult on issues of defense and foreign policy, because as we know, in democracies, most voters, not just Japan, but here in the United States and Europe and other democracies, they don't normally go to the polls and vote based on foreign policy questions. Um, and especially in our in the United States, for example, you tend to see those foreign policy or defense issues raised to the fore in elections when there is a war, right? And we are trying to end a forever war, for example, in our last election here in the United States. But Japan doesn't have those kinds of moments. It doesn't in its post-war period. So you rarely see those kinds of high politics, foreign policy, or defense issues be at the forefront of voters' minds. Um, so I think we still have some work to do. And it's actually one of the things I've been trying to think about. How would we go about structuring a survey that gets us a little bit closer to electoral behavior and foreign slash defense policies in a more effective way than we can do it now? The only thing we've got to go on is the shifting needle of public opinion polling, which we know is not the same as actual voter behavior, but public opinion polling over the last, the last two decades since the end of the Cold War has gradually, that needle has gone up on whether or not Japan feels, the Japanese public feel that the, the Japanese government needs to strengthen Japanese defenses. I say it's gone up, but it's gone up from 15% in 2000 to something like 28 or 29% in 2018. So not a dramatic shift, not something that overnight you would see a, a visible uptick in public desire for a stronger military. So I think we still have some work to do on that side. And so the election, this one election, of course, is not gonna tell you about what kind of contours of military power the Japanese people might be more willing to accept. And of course the LDP kept off the campaign trail, the delicate issues, the kinds of places, issues where the public sensitivities would be highest. And that would be obviously the acquisition of a conventional strike capability, which is the ability to acquire missiles or other kinds of weapon systems that would allow Japan to strike enemy bases or enemy facilities. That would be a very contentious domestic issue at home. Uh, and the second issue, of course, would be the placement of American tactical weapons on Japanese soil. And that would be obviously a very sensitive public issue as well. So those two very sensitive issues were not in the campaign on the campaign trail at all. Um, I think the, the article that I wrote really raised two longer term questions, which I think we'll have to have elections over time to watch. One is, of course, whether or not this is uh, indicative of a shift in the LDP's identity towards a much more hawkish or perhaps rightist position on either military power and or revisionist positions in terms of Japan's um, more ideologically inclined right. I think one of the things about Takaichi Sanai's candidacy was it got a lot of attention because of the realist military positions she was quite willing to put out front. But it's also true that Takaichi Sai, like Mr. Abe and like many others in the LDP, support some of the more revisionist positions on, on things like Yasukuni Shrine visits, constitutional revision, including Article 9, and things like male succession for the imperial family. So the LDP up until now has been quite careful in separating its sort of defense realists people who are very wonky on the military side of policy from the more, let's just say, ideologically driven nationalist revisionist right. And I feel in her candidacy, you started to see a fusion of these two strands uh, of thinking. And I don't know if that's a trend or if that was just characteristic of her, uh, her own positions. So, but it's something to watch for the LDP because typically inside the party, you've had a fairly significant counterbalance inside the party uh, on people who were, were pushing too hard either on the defense or on these more ideologically driven issues. Um, the, div the division between elites and the public, I think, deserves a little bit more attention. It'll take more time for us to gain access to this. I think public opinion polls are one piece of the puzzle. But if, you, if you've noticed, Abe, the Abe cabinets over time were quite willing to make fairly significant changes in security policy, including the reinterpretation of Article 9 for the right of collective self-defense two pieces of major legislation, the Secrecy Act, which the Abe cabinet put forward very early in his tenure in 2013, and then followed up by what, would, what we in the United States would call a counterterrorism bill, but it was called in Japanese a conspiracy, anti-conspiracy bill, um, much a little bit later on in his tenure. Those require legislative support. Therefore, those required and uh, the Abe cabinet had the benefit of a two thirds majority in the parliament. So therein lies, for decision-making going forward, 
uh, Takeuchi Sensei put, put forward the economic security bill. That is a piece of legislation that would require cooperation, not just with Kometo, but possibly with other parties as well, depending on what some of those components might be. And the economic security bill, at least as I understand it today, is also about has private sector implications. It also has what we would call the, Magnin the Magnitsky Act in the United States, which is sanctioning individuals or corporations that take steps that violate the interests of the Japanese state. So there could be a quite a, a, a significant debate in the parliament when that legislation goes through. So there will be some need, I think, to invite others other than the LDP and Komeito into that dialogue. Um, the, the last piece, of course, and this is a piece that the election is very obviously resolved in my mind, and I raised it in the article before the election, but that is the LDP garnered 261 seats on its own. You know, we, we talk about elections in the simple majority versus the supermajority, um, but there's a parliamentary process aspect to that 261 number that was really vital for the Kishida cabinet. And this is not just a security and foreign policy issue, it's an all policy issue. But the 261 number is magic because it allows the LDP to control the committee structure within the diet and basically to have a dominant voice in what legislation comes to the floor and what doesn't. And so that's a very important aspect of this election. When I saw the numbers ticking up on the NHK uh, board, I was like, oh, oh, here it comes. And 261 then gives the Kishida cabinet and the LDP a considerable advantage in parliamentary process. And of course, that will be important for whatever legislation goes forward, but particularly these issues, these sensitive issues of, of defense. Now, let me just talk a little bit about agenda because I don't want to speak too long, but on the defense side and then the foreign policy side, if you'll allow me to separate them out, there's some big, and this is a reason the title of my foreign affairs article was Japan's hard choices. There's some big, there's some big decisions that need to be made ahead one way or the other. Um, one is of course the annual uptick in Japanese defense spending. Now that's something that was introduced for, during the Abe cabinet. And it was introduced the last time there was a five-year procurement plan. The increase, the annual increase in the defense budget was built into that five-year plan. And that's not usually how budgets are made in Japan. But basically, uh, the Abe cabinet was able to get the Ministry of Finance's buy-in to a certain incremental increase in defense spending over five years, not annually negotiated, but, but agreed up front. Um, that will have to continue, and we'll have to see how much the LDP wants to accelerate defense spending. It's not going to go to 2% overnight, obviously. That would be a significant difference in Japanese spending. But how fast and how much the, the defense budget moves is obviously going to be very important for the Kishida cabinet. And that will be an early set of decisions over the next year to two years. Um, the other is, of course, the Japanese are going to rewrite their national security strategy. The first of that was drafted in 2013 under Prime Minister Abe. The second one is about to be redrafted. My understanding, though, the government does not want to do that until after next year's upper house election. So still, the upper house election next summer looms large in terms of how the, the security reforms are going to move forward. But immediately after that, we should expect a new national defense program outline, which is the Japanese 10-year defense plan, and then that a, another five-year procurement plan attached to that. So you'll see some, let's just say, some meat on the bones of the outlines of what what the Kishida and, and Takaichi and others have been talking about inside the party. The INF deployments, I will just leave it out in case anybody's interested. I don't know if we have any information that would be helpful here, but one thing in the alliance that's going to be very critical is a second two plus two meeting. And that second two plus two meeting is, is designed to focus on the question of Taiwan and a, tai, a potential Taiwan contingency. And of course that raises the specter of all kinds of questions uh, for Japanese and US military cooperation. Questions that of course will draw criticism uh, from the right and from the left, frankly, uh, as, they, as that contingency gets articulated and operationalized moving forward. So there's big choices ahead for Mr. Kishida, and we tend to think that Mr. Abe made all of the big security reforms, but in fact, some of these bigger ones are out there uh, in ahead uh, for Mr. Kishida, especially if he's there for a few years. I could spend a lot of time talking about the foreign policy agenda, but let me just make two very quick points and then wrap up and we'll move to Q&A. Um, the Kishida position on China has become fairly standard across the LDP and in fact across most of the major political parties in Japan. Um, this is not something that I see as being a very contentious 
electoral policy issue, nor do I see a lot of divisions. What I do think is going to happen is the push and the pull between the more hard line, let's use a very vague expression, but more assertive elements of the LDP and the Yixing could could put external pressure on the Kishida cabinet just a little bit. There are two outstanding issues. One, of course, is the suspended Xi state visit to Japan, and that was suspended from last April of 2020 because of the pandemic. Don't think that's an immediate decision because Xi, President Xi of, of the People's Republic of China is not traveling these days. He, um, but if he decides he wants to travel and asks for a rescheduling, that will put the, the Kishida cabinet in a, in a difficult position. The second, of course, is the CPTPP uh, request by both Taiwan and China. And so the trade issues could very well become an issue for the Kishida cabinet, mostly because Japanese business is somewhat supportive of the idea of China joining the CPTPP, or at least discussing a pathway to joining the CPTPP. The Japanese government has been more sympathetic to Taiwan's participation, but this could put Japan in the hot seat on regional trade issues in a way that would be politically sensitive for the Kishida cabinet. Um, let me stop here because I, I'm sure we could run through a whole list of foreign policy issues. The largest challenge I think is going to be South Korea. And I don't think that that's an immediate challenge due to South Korean elections, but it's certainly going to be something that uh, Prime Minister Kishida is going to walk a very difficult path, both because of the sentiment within his own party and the, the public sentiment writ large in Japan, which is fairly anti-compromise uh, when it comes to this question of the historical legacy issues with South Korea. But let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila. So we have uh, we have 13 minutes and quite a few great questions for everybody. Um, I'll start with a quick one, um, maybe for either uh, Mari or Harukata or Philip, on uh, whether Kishida uh, Kishida san comes out more reinforced from this election. And you know, there's all this discussion about his dependence on the three A's: Abe, Aso, and Amari. Uh, you know, what's going to happen to Amari San, who is the Secretary General, uh, after having lost his SMD seat? And does it, you know, has Kishida gained leverage in this election? Because uh, that will matter for a lot of the decisions that all of you have, have mentioned in every domain. Um, would anyone uh, want to jump on this one? Yeah, Harukata. I mean, he, he, he got he increased his authority within uh, the LDP for sure because no one really expected him to win this big and you know as Sheila has just said he won 2061 seats for LDP and that's something and um, I think the change of Secretary General from Amari to uh, Motegi-san in fact strengthen his power base within the LDP because many people thought he was he was kind of a puppet of Amari, but now he became independent. So I think um, with if I mean really depends on what kind of policies he formulates. I think now he has solid a power foundation within the LDP. I would I would second that. I I think it helps him. Uh, but going back to a point that Harukata was making earlier, I think whether he comes forward with a reformist agenda that's credible and popular will uh, be quite important because if his popularity follows the same trajectory as Suga, then that is going to immediately begin to diminish his authority within the party. And so, you know, it, you know, a lot, I think, hinges on where that goes. Great. Um, next, there are two questions for, for Mari. And you feel free to also address the Kishida question. Um, the, one is trying to understand how the JCP manages to have so many women elected. Do they try very hard? Do they have a you know sort of hard parity enforcement or any other mechanism? And the second question is how to make sense of the vote by young people for LDP. Uh, you know, when there have been so many opinion polls over decades actually showing that young people care about environmental issues, they're against nuclear issue, you know, they're for all the social uh, progress, and yet they still vote massively for the LDP, even though you saw a decline. Mm -hmm. um, and do we see um, um, if there is, uh, well, if there is any uh, right-minded, more nationalist young people, 
emerging basically actually we see that trend elsewhere like in china or korea we see more nationalism among young people than uh, you know relative to the generation above them so i'm curious about uh, your thoughts on those things yeah well, let me uh, answer to the first question first. Uh, JCP. Um, JCP has been quite active in promoting and also uh, fielding women at the local level, but at uh, the national level, they had difficulty to 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 fill can women candidates. But it was last December that JCP officially uh, approved or, or or adopted the policy. Of, of numerical target. So now they decided to have at least 50% women uh, in candidacy at all level of elections by 2030. So that's a sort of the official principle that JCP finally adopted. Uh, but I agree with the, 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 the person who posed the question. Uh, JCP could do better. And especially if you look at the peer list, uh, they don't usually use the, 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 the best loser principle. Uh, they, they rank individual candidate from number one, number two, number three, that way, the ordinal. That means that they could have alternate uh, candidates by gender, men, women, men, women, or women, men, women. Either way, uh, they have not done that. And a lot of feminists were very much disappointed that especially JCP didn't put Ikeuchi Saori, a very uh, famous feminist candidate, uh, on top or top two of the list, and she was number three. And she did quite well. Uh, in, in Tokyo district, but she didn't win the SSD, uh, so she didn't. Uh, she she lost the election. So I think G GCP is really advocating gender equality, and that's the the most. I mean, among the all the parties, GCP is the most uh, enthusiastically advocating for gender equality. So I think GCP needs to change their policy, uh, especially with respect with, with, with respect to PR list. And uh, talk about the gen, uh, new generation or young generation. I, I think there is a, a different trend. And then what I highlighted, yes, that they are margin. They're still on the margin. But nonetheless, I think that we should uh, put an eye on those uh, new uh, type of uh, advocates. And especially when it, you know, the, 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 there are a growing number of activists, young activists, women and men who talk about human rights issues. And that is completely new compared to the old generation. That's why I uh, highlighted those new trends. But at the same time, the large majority of young generation are kept silent and they are not interested in politics where they think that they can change society by participating in politics. Their sense of political efficacy remains to me very, very, very low. So if you look at the trend or the majority, uh, you know, what I said is maybe sounds quite strange, but I just wanted to highlight that a new trend and which I think that means the future of Japan. Uh, and do I see the right-minded, or I mean the, the sort of nationalist young generation? Um, I don't see those groups yet, uh, especially among the people, uh, high-educated people uh, in Tokyo. But it's possible that those uh, the people might emerge eventually, but uh, I don't see uh, those trends yet. And what is interesting to me is that when I engage the conversation with my students, the college students, Sophia universities, you know, they, they are very much, um, you know, middle ground. Uh, they don't have much strong opinion about politics, but it's so surprising that they are so frustrated with ADB handling of COVID-19 crisis. I didn't see that kind of frustration never in my almost 20 years teaching history experience. And also they are quite, they, they have, they express more opinions about politics, which is also new. Maybe this is online. They, they don't need to be shy <laughs> to express opinions online compared to stand up and, you know, to, to speak up in front of classmates in classroom. That could be the reason. But I'm so surprised that many young people talk about politics more and more. Uh, so what I want to say is that even though this is a tiny majority, but still uh, we, sh we should be aware that this new type of generation is emerging. Great, yeah, thank you. Those are fabulous comments. Um, so then we have two questions for Harukata. Uh, one on COVID 
uh, is it possible to say that the pandemic was less significant than expected in the election and that people in the end credited more uh, you know, the results for, uh, you know, for the, with the local government, not the national government. Uh, and the second question relates to this uh, new approach by Kishita-san on new capitalism. And uh, Sebastian Le Chevalier is asking, what are the intellectual and practical origins of this new approach, right? Which sort of came suddenly, uh, and, you know, in some ways reminds us of the 2009 DPJ agenda, maybe, uh, so where does it come from? What are the uh, intellectual origins? Uh, and what are the key advisors, you know, what, key ministries? Where does it come from, right? Um, yeah, I think, uh, let me start with the second question. I think uh, he, uh, Kishida uh, ran for the LDP presidential election last year and he prepared uh, key economic policies for, for the last one. I mean, not the 2021, but I'm talking about 2020. And uh, he, I mean, basically he brought over the policies he prepared for 22 to 21. And I think it comes from really tradition of his faction, Kochikai. And, uh, and the Kochikai has very uh, talented uh, politicians uh, for, uh, who are familiar with policies. And I think they, uh, they, they, they have noticed uh, the issue of economic disparity widening in Japanese society. And uh, he wanted, they wanted to highlight uh, the difference uh, between uh, his faction and uh, Sewakai uh, or the Koizumi Abe factions, because which attached more importance to structural reforms. Okay, so I think that intellectual origins and that kind of thought has some support from uh, some economy professors who considers that the Japanese companies have not made a uh, uh, significant investment in past two decades. And so uh, those are kind of intellectual origins, I think. And for the COVID-19 question, I think the Japanese voters are not really happy as uh, Maris Marisan has said. Um, but, and I think they are not really happy with, uh, I don't think they are content with uh, the responses of the local governments either, but they are more, and I think, I don't think they, uh, except for some uh, areas like Osaka where the governors were very eloquent, mm -hmm. I don't think many people, uh, many Japanese people can tell differences between the responses of the local governments and the central government. And I think uh, many, many Japanese people feel that it is really the responsibilities of the central government to deal with the crisis. And they are very, they have been very unhappy. But fortunately for this, uh, for this election, because the fifth wave uh, went down. I don't know the reasons. Maybe I think it, the major reasons is for the vaccinations, but I think there must be something else. But so this issue did not really hurt the LDP. Although if you like the public opinion surveys, I think like 45% or 50% of the respondents respond that they, have not, they are not happy with the, the government responses. So thank you very much. And maybe we'll add a, a couple minutes to have a couple questions on foreign affairs. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is one question on the Iran deal, mm -hmm. potential resurrection, and the potential Japanese connection there. Whether you know Japan will play with this and help. Uh, and I think uh, will be also interesting to ask you since we just had the G20, we have uh, the COP26. Where do we see Kishida? playing a, a key role in, in those global order questions, right? The global governance questions uh, and climate is very salient in Japan. Obviously, yeah, thank you. And I know we're over time, so I'll try to be brief. On the Iran yeah. issue, um, the JCPOA, of course, did not include Japan. It was the P5 plus one, which is the P5 are the, the, the permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany with the EU's cooperation, right? So you had a structure that was built into the negotiations with Iran. There was some uh, overtures to see if Japan might be willing uh, to play a role in that at that point in time. But of course, it, it Japan didn't fit nicely into the structure. And Japan was also not really willing to to get engaged in the what would happen if it went wrong part of the deal, of course, which was would involve sanctions. Um, so you've got a, an elaborate negotiating strategy and framework, but also a Japanese hesitancy to 
push itself too far into that framework in a way that where it would have to use instruments it wasn't comfortable using. But I think the, the idea is that Japan and Iran have a very close connection, ha always have, uh, and that continues today. Um, and I think it's a positive for the United States, but also for the Euro European countries and others who are engaged in negotiating with Japan. So Japan's strong non-proliferation stance and its partnership with Iran and other elements, I think is really important um, to that. Um, on the climate change and large, writ large global governance, I think Prime Minister Kishida obviously comes from a tradition where he sees global governance as being uh, deeply in Japan's interests and a strong and activist Japan under Prime Minister Kishida on the global stage would be what I would expect. I am not an energy or climate change specialist, so I don't want to speak in areas where I, I don't have expertise, but I have not seen uh, him yet pull back on the carbon neutral by 2050 pledge that Prime Minister Suga, maybe our Japanese colleagues of Professors Takenaka and Professor Muda might have a different sense of that than me. But I think that's maybe that may be uh, the path he continues to hold to, but I don't know um, going forward wh whether or not that's going to be true or not. I do see uh, Mr. Kishida as being very active following in the footsteps of obviously Prime Minister Abe in the regional diplomacy in the Indo-Pacific, but absolutely in the UN frameworks and the G20 and uh, the climate change issue. I do see him wanting Japan to have a strong presence. Mm. It'd be worse to also ask you a quick follow-up on, on the Taiwan issue, mm -hmm. because uh, Japan obviously is different from, uh, you know, say if Canada discussed Taiwan, because Japan is a frontline uh, country, as they often remind us, right, the Japanese. And so if, yeah. if there is any escalation of wow. rhetoric or, you know, flights and all that stuff, uh, and we already saw the fleet going to between the Russians and the Chinese in the north, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's very, very personal in the sense that Japan becomes a target. Uh, a physical target, a kinetic target. Uh, so how do you think this will play out? In a sense, it only makes sense if Japan also increases its defense, its missile defense and missile capacity, whatever, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a security dilemma with escalation potential. Mm -hmm. So there's two pieces in the history of the US-Japan mm -hmm. relationship, which would be the framework for thinking about a Taiwan contingency and a combined mm -hmm. response, US-Japan together. Mm. The, our, our military planning has largely been premised on a contingency on the Korean Peninsula. And this is historically true. It goes all the way back to the 60s. So a lot of the understanding about use of bases, for example, on Japanese territory by US forces, the kinds of operational integration or at least coordination, it's not quite full integration, but coordination between US and Japanese forces in the region, they're all built up around a Korean contingency, not around a Taiwan contingency. So that's one thing. So there's a couple of things that would be different here. The Korean contingency, of course, has UN engagement. So the base use question would be, a lot of people don't understand this, but the status of forces agreement between the United States and Japan also includes uh, the use of bases under the UN command that is part of the Korean Peninsula response. So there is no automaticity here in what's already been decided in the Alliance for Korea that would just be slapped onto a Taiwan contingency. That is not gonna work because of the UN uh, engagement on the Korean Peninsula. So there would have to be negotiations about that. I think given the proximity you pointed out, it's 120 kilometers at the closest point. This is not distance that, that you should feel very safe if you were in the Southwestern islands of Japan, if a conflagration were to arise there, whether it's a small one or a large one, you are, you know, you're right, Japan is a frontline state. So I suspect that it would involve not just existing military facilities, self-defense force and US, which as you know, are in the, in the Okinawa Southwestern islands. It may also involve civil use of civil uh, airfields and things like that. So there's a whole range of issues the US and Japanese governments need to discuss and they need to imagine the contingency together. And that's where you hear Defense Minister Kishi and State Minister Nakayama of the Ministry of Defense saying, we don't understand American planning. We don't know what the Americans would do in a contingency like that. So we need to understand the operational concept that the Americans would bring to the table for a Taiwan contingency. So you can see the various dimensions, base use, integrated forces, combined command, all kinds of things that would or, or have to be organized around ta Taiwan that would have in, incredible political consequences for whoever is prime minister. Um, but that planning process is going to be is going to need to be pretty detailed. If you listen to people who talk about Chinese behavior, if I could just conclude with two sentences, I hate to drone on on this issue, though. 
I think the problem right now is that the US and Japan are too focused on the military side and that the real agenda for the US and Japan, and we're starting to see it, we saw it at the G7 meeting, uh, we're seeing it in many bilateral conversations Japan is having with others like Canada, um, is this is a diplomatic first and foremost mission, I think, for the US and Japan and for, for all of the nations who think that uh, it is worthwhile raising the costs to China of thinking about the use of force across the Taiwan Straits. Uh, Ch China has deep interest in a long-term integration with Taiwan, but I think we should all collectively think about the diplomatic and economic uh, incentives we can create uh, that will make it much, much more costly for China, for China to take the, take the road of military force. So I hate to see us funnel into only the military piece because I think the larger piece is far more important and probably far more effective. Well, thank you for those uh, sobering words. And uh, <laughs> so we, I think we have covered many dimensions. Thanks to all four of you here uh, of this uh, fascinating country at a very important time. Um, maybe I'll turn to Philip, my co-organizer, if you want to say uh, any other words. Oh, no, I don't have anything to add. This was spectacular. And I thank uh, the panelists as well as the audience for joining us. Uh, it was a great discussion. Thank you very much. And maybe, uh, uh, Joseph, would you want to add anything? Oh. Mm -hmm. As long as my dog doesn't bark. Mm -hmm. um, you no, know, there's tremendous uh, expertise that was uh, brought uh, together. Um, I was thinking as you were all speaking, um, Prime Minister Kishida has, be, has now the task of bringing all of those pieces together. And no matter how close you are uh, to, um, uh, to the top in, in governments and democracies, how close you are to the Prime Minister or the President, um, and how informed you, you are and how um, you have an understanding of all how the pieces come together. At the end of the day, uh, the prime minister or the president or the national leader is the person who has to make this judgment. And um, uh, preparing for this uh, seminar, um, I read a lot more about uh, Prime Minister Kishida. And I think Japan is lucky to have someone of his caliber at this particular time. Because as uh, my little note on Japanese history, uh, post-war and, and politicians uh, indicates, there are really uh, uh, leaders who understand the dynamic and who create policies that move Japan forward and those that don't. And the last thing Japan needs right now is um, Kaiten Shishoi, you know, a, uh, a um, revolving door prime minister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. So thank you to all four of you and thank you to, to the audience uh, for being with us today. And with this, we are closing our event. Thank you. Thank you. For